session. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, ensuring that workers in the garment industry who are mostly women get paid a living wage is an important human rights issue. Oxfam Australia launched their What She Makes campaign in 2017 and have been engaging with both Australian and international brands to assist them on their journey towards paying a living wage. This side session for the OECD forum on due diligence in the garment and footwear um, for the garment and footwear will focus on the role of separating labor costs for addressing human rights risk and maintaining competitiveness in the garment industry. Let me start with an introduction of our panel speakers. Here we have Sarah Negro from Global Affairs, uh, Global Public Affairs Senior Manager at H&M Group. She has been an, at H&M since 2018 in roles at the sustainability team in production, driving H&M Group's work around wages. As of 2021, Sarah has been responsible for public affairs in production countries. She continues to use her expertise in areas of minimum wage, social protection, and purchasing practices, while also working on climate and related topics. We have with us Robin Parkin, Head of Sustainability and Advocacy at Ethical Partners Fund Management. Robin holds qualifications in high impact leadership from the Cambridge University Institute of Sustainability, postgraduate qualifications in international public health from UNSW and is currently completing her Masters of International Development at RMIT. Robin's role involves developing and coordinating ethical partners, environmental, social, and governance strategy, and coordinating ethical partners, ESG reporting, team education, and stewardship activities. We have here um, Kalpana Akhtar, who's the executive director, Bangladesh Center for Workers. Kalpana is a labor activist from Bangladesh. She is the founder and executive director of Bangladesh Center for Workers Solidarity and was awarded Human Rights Watches Alison Desforges Award for Extraordinary Activism. And we will also be having with us joining here Faisal Samad, senior board member, BGMEA. He has been involved with Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association for 25 years up to a senior vice president level. He is currently manage, the managing director of Savartex Group in Bangladesh, which is comprising of a neat vertical integrated industry from fabric production to garments, socks manufacturing facility, design and printing unit. Lastly, I am Nirvana Mujtaba, women's rights policy and advocacy specialist, policy and campaign at Oxfam Canada. I have extensive experience working in international development on issues related to gender inclusion and diversity, displacement and migration, labor rights, human rights, women empowerment and modern slavery, mainly with funding from the private sector, foundations and our traditional donors. I will be facilitating today's discussion. Today we will have a facilitated discussion with our honorable panel speakers for up to 45 minutes. Questions raised by the audience in the chat box can draw in the final discussion for the last half an hour. While we would like to get all the questions, it may not be possible to address all of them. Our moderators will select questions with a view to providing greater insight and representing very, very varied uh, perspectives. This session will explore why, why separating labor costs in the supply chain is an important step towards ensuring living wages and will create a practical discussion on the approaches used. Separating labor costs, also known as ring fencing, is a purchasing practice that involves itemizing the cost of labor during price negotiations. A living wage is not a luxury, but is a minimum that all working people should be paid if they are to escape the cycle of poverty. A living wage should be earned in a standard work week, no more than 48 hours at max, by a worker and be sufficient to afford a decent standard of living for the worker and their family. Elements of a decent standard of living include adequate nutritious food, housing, healthcare, clothing, transportation, energy and water, 
childcare, education, and other essential needs, including some discretionary money and provision for unexpected events. So today's discussion, um, let's um, start with you today, Kalpona. Would you, would you be able to share why are wages a human rights issue and what's the implication of getting it wrong? Thank you so much for uh, you know having me here and all the participants. Thank you so much for your patience, uh, you know, to sticking with us, to listening to everyone. So to your question, that you know, the worker rights are human rights. It's very simple. So when we talk about the worker rights, the very first thing come out that is my wages. When I work in the factory, I should be paid an adequate amount of money. So I have a life where, uh, you know, that confirms that I have food in the table, I have uh, money for my health uh, when it is needed, and I have money for my children education. So these are very, very common essential that need to meet uh, uh, when I work for a company, a, you know, whatever the owner we talk about, but the in reality is different. Like the workers, those are working in garment supply chain, Mostly they are ending their work in a poverty wages. So do here in my country where uh, the minimum wage is $95 a month. And for skilled workers, uh, you can add like few bucks more, but it is never enough for one month, one person full month cost, uh, let alone if they have two children at home. And why it is not? Because the cost of living is, is so high in here. And top of that, like workers need to spend over 30, 35% for their housing. And it's not a dream house where you have, you have like living, living room or separate toilet or et cetera. It is 10 by 10, uh, you know, concrete room. Sometimes it doesn't have window. And our workers ruining their life while they are, uh, you know, making this fast fashion or sometime high value production in here. It needs to be discussed. It needs to be discussed a long ago and a step from the industry as well as you know the brand and retailers should be taking long long before to ensure the people those are producing these clothes they have these essential human rights for them uh, a job that ensures they have a living wage over to you nirvana thank you so much kalbona um robin would you want would you like to add anything here with Kalpona. Oh, hi. Um, thank you. Sorry about the IT difficulties. Um, and thanks everyone for being so patient. Um, yes, um, look, I, I've only actually just managed to jump on. Um, would you mind repeating the question, Nirvana? Sorry. Uh, we, were, we were talking about why are wages a human rights issue and what's the implication of getting it wrong? Absolutely. Well, yep. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. And um, as investors, we absolutely see living wages as, as a very salient and material human rights issue, both for companies, but also for investors to address. You know, it's very clearly a human rights issue that, uh, that unlocks all of the other SDGs, decent work, but also unlocks SDG 3 on health, uh, poverty, food, gender equality, inequality. Um, and there's obligations on both companies and investors to address living wage as a human rights risk under the UN grinding principles and of course under the OECD multinational guidelines and we really strongly believe there are real implications of, of getting these in obligations on human rights including living wage wrong they're not only moral but they're legal they're regulatory they're financial and they're also investment implications and so that that's the reason we screen for living wage as part of our human rights assessment in every investment we, we make but it's not just us. Ethical investing is um, on track to exceed 53 trillion US by 2025. Um, but the requirements on investors go far beyond those that identify as ethical investors anyway. There's market-wide changes to how fiduciary duties being understood. There's increasing investor attention to the S in ESG. In Australia, the superannuation funds are legally requiring all investors to address human rights and modern slavery risk. In Australia, under the modern slavery legislation, directors are responsible. And um, we see modern slavery and decent work as part of a continuum of human rights and living wage is certainly part of that. As you all know, there's increasing legislation globally. There's the EU human rights due diligence, which comes with liability enforcement and a requirement to remedy. 
Uh, there's German, French and Dutch legislation. There's increasing human rights litigation. We've sent a lot of WRO uh, withhold and release order bans on um, other areas. And we see that that's an area that definitely could um, move to apparel and garments as well. There's increased attention from investor bodies. Uh, there's increased engagement by large investors and engagement on living wages becoming expected by our clients. And then there's increasing pressure on us as investors to show that we're addressing these issues like the EU taxonomy, which obliges us to do due diligence on our portfolios as well. Uh, and COVID's only accelerated these risks. You know, it, the existing inequalities and vulnerabilities have been uh, exaggerated, but also the awareness on these issues from investors, from customers, and just the expectation of a social license to operate has really increased during COVID. We've seen increasingly fragile supply chains and increasing understanding that workers are a valuable resource and an increasing understanding that inequality harms us all and it harms the global economy. That resilient economies need people who can withstand economic shocks and well-paid workers are an integral part of a profitable, resilient value chain. So um, on top of that, you know, peace and stability are clearly linked to inequality. The ILO said way back in 1919, peace and harmony in the world requires an adequate living wage. So whilst, you know, S, the living wage and human rights are often seen as less financially impactful than, say, the E in ESG, we think this is really changing. We've seen several companies suffering really substantial financial losses within the last few years. And um, as well as risk, we see that not addressing these issues means a real loss of opportunity for companies as well. Customers and investors are, are increasingly looking for companies to lead in how they're addressing living wage as a com customers. So uh, to answer the question, there are very clear implications of not addressing these risks, you know, investor support, legal risks, reputational risks, regulatory risks, loss of opportunity and a myriad of financial uh, risks. So we definitely see it as an important human rights risk. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you, Robin and Kalpana for um, putting light into the issue about why uh, wages is um, a human rights issue and what could actually go wrong over here. Sarah, I would like to ask you, um, could you please share why H&M has chosen to implement separating labor costs? Yes, absolutely. Um, hi, everyone, first of all. Uh, and Thank you for your patience in, uh, in joining this very important panel. We are very happy that we are making it, uh, notwithstanding the uh, technical troubles at the beginning. Um, so you've been asking me uh, why we have chosen to implement separating labor costs. So let me just start by saying that uh, purchasing practices is a rather complex issue. And uh, if you look into different uh, stakeholders, such as uh, Better Work, the flagship organization and initiatives of ILO, ILO itself, or other stakeholders that are operating in this environment, such as Better Vine or even uh, other organizations, you will find different definitions of what is included in purchasing practices. To us, uh, and in researching this topic in uh, quite a long period of time, because we've been researching really this topic since uh, 2014, when we took our external commitments also to join ACT, uh, which is one of the most important initiatives in the industry. To us, within purchasing practices, the possibility to distinguish and keep the labor costs separated in the quotation process, and then of course also in the negotiation process is absolutely essential. So this is part of our external commitments. It is why we are part of ACT, and uh, it is what we commit to. Uh, ring fencing the labor cost is important because it will allow to have a number, to have a, a component of the final price in the negotiation with the suppliers that is kept separated and that is targeting to pay the wages. We believe that this is absolutely one of the key components of purchasing practices. And why is that? We believe that that is a um, essential element for wages to be paid correctly, to be paid at least at the legal minimums, but of course we are aiming at living wages and that are paid correctly and in time. And also that over time is of course included and paid in the correct way. Um, 
This is not to say that separating the labor costs is an easy operation. It is not. I think the industry is still debating on how to do that. I'm also available for more questions, even separately uh, on this area. I would be happy to share our challenges, our learnings over the years, and where we are at today on the ring fencing. Um, hope these um, gives you some elements, but of course, for any follow-up question, I am more than happy to keep digging on onto this area, which for me is really fascinating and is really core to what we do for securing living wages. Thank you so much, Sarah. I have a follow-up question for you here. Um, after H&M has chosen to implement separating labor costs, how do you feel that the factory owners felt about uh, separating the labor costs? Were there diversity in views on this? So it would be very interesting to ask them directly. I can only offer you my interpretation and my opinion of what has been their reaction. So the reaction has been quite positive. Um, it, the ring fencing of the, um, uh, the labor costs within the price is part of a bigger mechanism by which we ask them to quote our to quote the price for the products we would like to buy from them. And this is a, a part of a bigger platform that we really use with all of our suppliers uh, that are making quotations for us for the clothing industry. So uh, it is a wide system and we have implemented it progressively. So it has been definitely a, a steep learning curve. At the beginning, even understanding one another and really understand what the different components we were asking to be quoted, one of them, of course, being the labor cost, has been challenging because it is not easy to uh, move from saying how much the workers make in terms of monthly salary to how big the quote in that specific price is to be uh, finalized to pay in the wages. There is a lot of calculations, a lot of technicalities in it. So it took us quite some time to understand one another and to really have the system up and running. I believe today it is giving us quite good results. And I believe that the suppliers are now aware of our commitments, first of all, which is absolutely important. And I think that they are honestly using it to the uh, best of their abilities uh, to secure that this part is actually guaranteed for the workers. But I would be very happy also to hear directly from them. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, Faisal Samad from BGMEA has just joined us. Um, just for your background, Faisal, um, we have been discussing about why uh, wages are a human rights issue and what's the implications of getting it wrong. We've heard from Kalpona and Robin and also from Sarah about how H&M has chosen to implement separating labor costs. And it would be really good to also hear from your end about how factory owners feel about separating labor costs? Is there a diversity of views on this? Uh, good afternoon, I guess, or good evening, wherever, whichever part of the world you may be in. I am Faisal Samad. I'm the uh, immediate form of senior vice president of BGMEA. Uh, I served under Rubana Haq, uh, who was a former president. And currently I'm a senior board member uh, in the BGMEA. Uh, um, so, um, thank you for, for, uh, uh, for asking me to join this uh, panel discussion. Um, to get down to the, to the point of, uh, sort of uh, incorporating wages, I'm sorry, I'm in the car, so it's going to be a bit noisy. Um, so, incorporating wages into the cost structure, is that correct, or reflecting it on the on the pricing structure. Was that the question? Yes. Okay. Well, from a factory perspective, I think that it's uh, it, it's very interesting if uh, if such a a factor would be included. Um, however, um, my you know uh, my distinguished panelists who are uh, you know present here, I, I would I'm I'm sorry that I missed it. I, I was held up in another meeting. But uh, I, I would have been interesting to learn um, you know, how it would be advantageous because as a factory, 
uh, and uh, you know our position is that of the receiving end, where um, you know the compliances, uh, the compliance world is quite separate from the buying world. And my own experience, I've been part of the BGMEA for more than 25 years now, and I've I've held uh, different positions and I've been in different sort of uh, committees where such discussions have occurred. But there is always a, a a difference between the buyers, what the budgets they have to work with, and the and what the CSR policy or the compliance policies of the of the uh, of the relevant brand may be. So, so that's why it would have been interesting to learn how would we do this then? Because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when, uh, when it comes to uh, placing business, it's a commercial side of the business. And when it comes to the compliance or considering the sort of the, you know, uh, the future and the betterment of the, of the workers or, or, or and, you know, the welfare of the country is concerned, uh, not only labor, uh, but overall the country's welfare is concerned, you know, uh, that's a different conversation. There are different uh, uh, engagements there. So it's, uh, it's unless we understand and we sort that out, I don't really see how this would be plausible and how this could be actually be implemented. Uh, you know, there is the act, which is under consideration or under review right now. Um, so you know, so there are multiple platforms who are thinking along those lines, but to bring it to reality, and I'm not being pessimistic here, but to bring it to reality, I think we need to really have the buyers on board and, 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 and the factories would participate because the wages and the, and the cost component of that, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and that's being reflected on a cost sheet or on a pricing uh, sheet. Uh, would be interesting because uh, because that is the main factor besides the financing cost. So so if if that's covered and and that is beneficial to the to the to the workers uh, uh, and and that is uh, accepted by the buyers and if that works out, uh, then I, I don't see it to be anything wrong. I think that it could it could be interesting because that is a, that is the part where we struggle where we tell the buyers that, listen, you know, when you're offering us these prices, uh, as you do, uh, how do you expect us to accommodate this? You know, because obviously, you know, these are challenges that we're facing because we have to take the reality of the cost into consideration. So uh, so that, you know, I, I, I hope that I've been able to summarize my thoughts on that. But uh, for now, I would, I would leave it at this. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions uh, or any comments. Thank you so much, Faisal. That was an interesting point of view um, from the per factory owner's perspective as well. Um, Kalpona, could you um, share with us like um, how do workers advocate feel about separating labor costs? Is there a diversity of views on this? Thank you, Nirvana. I think, you know, the better use of that, only the manufacturers would know. But for me, you know, I would take it in a different way. You know, understanding the living wage, it is not a rocket science. It is so, you know, um, it is so easy to understand. The people need money, okay? The workers, those are working, they need money. Whether you are separating the cost, whether it will be helping or not, as a trade unionist or worker representative, Bottom line is our workers need money and make it, uh, we just want it to get through, okay? And like, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing like Sarah, I'm hearing Robin uh, and I hear uh, Faisal Samad just now. Um, if we talk about a living voice in a broad way, like the H&M, um, I, th I think it is like uh, eight or eight years ago or so, in back 2013, they have promised that uh, within 2018, they will be ensure uh, the workers in their supply chain uh, have a living wage. But when we 2018, we started speaking on that, we found the empty promise. I know that many, uh, both uh, Sarah and uh, Mr. Faisal has been talking about the act, okay? And I'm also industrial executive board member. I know the industrial, this is the industrial pay, you know, piece. But we have to remember that all this initiative or whatever H&M said back in 2013, and it was not take place because it was promised 
there wasn't any uh, you know, legal obligation. So do the act doesn't have any obligation, whether you're signing it or not, you don't see any obligations if you don't ensure the, you know, I mean, if you don't pay the living wage by the X, Y, Z time. And it also says that uh, the, the living wage will be ensured through the uh, workers bargaining capacity. The country we are, you know, we are in, the union, we have a number of quality, uh, sorry, we have a quantitative union number, but not the qualitative. So, you know, bargaining through union and getting the union, uh, getting the living wage, it will take us another two, two, three decades, and we cannot wait for that, okay? So what is very easy to understand for me, even if we press our manufacturers in here and government without having the brands on board, it would be quite impossible, not quite impossible, it would be impossible for workers to have a living wage or manufacturers to ensure the living wage. The very basic calculation that I understand, the brands need to add few cents more with the government they're sourcing from production countries like us in order to ensure a living wage. It is that easy calculation for me. I really don't care. It is coming through like you are separating the labor cost uh, or what are you doing? I mean, it's all your calculation. It is the business calculation for worker, for worker rep. My duty is that, or I do want to understand our workers getting living wage and without having brand's contribution, it's not possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kalpona. I actually have a follow-up question for you here. You have been critical of brands and manufacturers in the past where you felt that the response, where they have the responsibilities for low wages, where it lies. Um, we heard an interesting story about a worker finding out about how much uh, cloth, uh, clothing prices are in retail in the US. We, want, we would want to hear that story of a worker and the experience. Yeah, it will take like a few minutes, but you know, uh, please bear with me, okay? So, um, you know, after Rana Plaza, we did a, a, a global speaking tour with workers to have these brands to get on board to sign the Accord on Bangladesh Fire and Building Safety. So I had a survivor from Rana Plaza. Her name was Reva Shikdar. She was with me in, in, in the US. We were like do, doing two like 17 states or some places within the university and et cetera. So we were in New York City uh, in the high street when we are protesting in front of the stores who were being sourcing from, I mean, not necessarily from Rana Plaza for many, many other, you know, uh, many other factories in here because we wanted all them to sign the accord. So, and meanwhile, there was a poor rain and we need a shed. So we, we ran to uh, get a shelter in a gap store. So for me, I have seen where the clothes are selling. It was not a cultural shop for me because I've been many times to the abroad, but for Reba, uh, for a factory worker and that teenage, it was a cultural shock for her. She was like, is this a clothes that we make? And I said, not necessarily that you make, but yeah, this is what they sell, the clothes that making in our countries. So she said, she asked that whether she can go around. And I said, of course you can. And she, uh, you know, walking around and she stood up in front of a clothing set where they're selling skinny jeans for teenager girls, okay? And she was like holding one and looking into, and I was like counting. I said, oh my gosh, she's gonna have questions now for me. And yeah, within 30 seconds, she asked me, hey, uh, this looks good. And I said, do you want one? She said, no, I have two pair of them, so I don't want, but I want to know how much it cost. And I have to be honest, I said it is 75 plus X. I didn't say which currency and it was intentional. And uh, then within 10 seconds, I was counting and I know that she will be asking me same question again. I mean, within 10 seconds, she asked me that, by the way, which currency it is? And I had to be honest and I said, it is US dollars. And the scream she did, the whole store can hear. She literally skimmed. She said, she started calculating like one taka, one dollar means 82 taka. And these skinny jeans cost my whole month's salary. And with you know, 60 worker in a 10 hour shift, we make 1200 piece of these jeans a day. Then where the hell money goes? 
So that, that you know, effectively work and to understand who enjoy the bigger piece of pie. Definitely these 75, I know there is a, you know, value added money. I know this, you know, the cost of making, there is a manufacturing cost, there is a shipping cost, but it's still, just think about the worker who was making 6,000 plus during those days, and she was holding a jeans that's selling 75 plus in a Gap store. So a factory worker even can understand that, uh, I mean, she has a question where the hell money goes, and she knows that she is not given, I mean, she's not even getting a $1 from out of that pant. Nirvana. Thank you so much, Kalpona, um, for um, sharing this story with us. And um, Faisal, I would like to come to you and um, would like to understand uh, what do you feel are the biggest improvements that the brands can make to their purchasing practices? Well, I think that... Uh you know, for the brands to improve their purchasing practices, as Kalpana said herself, that uh, you have to look back at your own commercial cost, at your own selling prices. I'm sure everybody has overheads to cover. So when you have overheads to cover and we're literally counting cents, and that's the level of negotiation. And really, uh, and I'm, I'm sure Kalpana, uh, she has a, a global access to the, <clears throat> the, you know, the labor markets across the globe. I mean, is in, is in Asia possibly. And if you, if you look at it and you see that uh, the, the brands for the same article, when they come to Bangladesh, they'll ask for 15% less prices. And then when we ask the buyers, why? Why do we have to pay less price by same article from, from Turkey or from Indonesia or from China? Uh, why, why do we have to pay? Because it's a preconceived notion that Bangladesh is a cheap country. So we should be cheaper than anybody else. And I think that these are, these are sort of the mental frame of minds that the buyers must be cultured either with budgets as well as with their thinking on approach to the country as well. You see, even in India today, uh, you know, uh, the brands, the US brands who have presence in India, is all big brands. You go to the US stores, you see all these big brands who are buying uh, out of India huge volume of business, not in Bangladesh, but we could be maybe more competitive. And if they do come, again, as, the, as, the, as I said, you know, it's got to be cheaper. So I think that, that if I talk about Bangladesh, given that I'm a Bangladeshi manufacturer, first and foremost is the approach towards Bangladesh. Today, we are not only, we can produce multiple kinds of garments. We're not a basic country anymore. So having produced the multiple uh, uh, you know, products that we are offering to the buyers, I think it's time that the brands look at as well as, you know, as a country, the risk levels are less. We're the, one of the safest countries in the world to, to be producing after Accord uh, and our you know, uh, uh, an alliance work to the industry, which other country has done that? So when your risk is less, when the labor are skilled, then yes, you know, it needs to be looked at a different picture now. Uh, and not only about that, you know, uh, uh, sense, uh, 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 about uh, uh, sense and, 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 be, and, and sort of, uh, I know, uh, sort of making the manufacturers, you know, bear, bear the, the, uh, the mere minimal costs. So that would be one, one, one point of view. Uh, the, the second is that uh, um, I think that, you know, uh, we, you know, we were talking about uh, uh, the, the living wages. Um, I think that here too, as much as factories and the brands also have, I think that the, the, the labor side is also, there's a, there's a reflection from there as well, which needs to be brought in, which is the efficiencies. You see, if you, again, if you, if you cross, uh, uh, you know, take the data across Southeast Asia and you see the efficiency levels, the efficiency levels must also improve. And, and I'm sure Kalpana knows this and, and uh, Ms. Kalpana is working with the, as a union to help the, uh, the labor sector develop that. Uh, because without efficiency, you know, whatever the, the, the costs may be, uh, or whether it's on the buyer's end or as the factory end, somebody's gonna bear the cost. And the way to bear the cost is by becoming efficient. 
So there are multiple factors actually, which needs to be kind of tabled out, which is already tabled out in many cases, but then again, to bring it together, you know, uh, as I said, you need to bring the buyers of the brands into this conversation. And, I, and I've said this, not today, I said this 20 years ago, uh, when, uh, when uh, one of the uh, union, union leaders at the time, Neil was alive still. And this, I remember in Toronto, we had a, we had a seminar, I think it was in 2000, I can't remember, maybe 2004, five, six, uh, where, where, you know, well, till date, no buyers are coming. So the buyers need to come or the buying directors need to come. So they are cultured into the thinking of what their compliances are talking about. I hope that helps to answer. I went about a, in a bit of a roundabout way, but I hope I got the point across. Thank you. Yes, absolutely, Faisal. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned about the risks. Um, Sarah, um, I would like to come to you. Like when we're talking about the risks, what are the risks associated with separating labor costs? And how did you mitigate them? And how do you plan to mitigate them? Absolutely, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, and I absolutely want to reply to that. But first, I feel that I need to add on something that uh, some of the other panelists have mentioned before, if you allow me. So I want to go back to the point of our commitment made in 2013 about fair living wages, because uh, I think that's a, an important uh, milestone that we need to cover in this panel to put things uh, into, into the right perspective, into the right light. So in 2013, the H&M Group did commit to the statement that the suppliers should be paying the living wages. Uh, after all, uh, we are not a direct employer of the workers in our supply chain and the purchasing practices should be exactly that, a key enabler for that to be possible. Now, we do not believe purchasing practices are the only element for wages to, to grow and to move as fast as possible to the level of the living wages. We all know here that there are several components, that several elements that are absolutely key for wages to go up and purchasing practices by themselves alone cannot do that. And I will go then to cover the risk because this is strictly connected to your question on the risk. But before I do that, I just wanna tap on another couple of points that the other panelists have made that to me are very important. The first one is the importance of having regulations in place. We absolutely agree. Our studies on the trend that we see in wages in the different markets we operate with, with our supply chain, is that the minimum wage still accounts between 70 and 95% of what the workers make. What does that mean to us? It means that the minimum wage is a key element that we need to address. Now, in Bangladesh, we know that the minimum wage is updated every five years. And although those updates might be very substantial, I, if I remember correctly from at the top of my head, in the last update, we had a 43% increase. It is clear that an update every five years is not, is not good enough for us to be able to, to do business in a, in a smooth and predictable way, which is at the very basis, at the very core of having good purchasing practices between the brands and the suppliers. So I want to put back into the picture here the importance of minimum wage, because that is what the data tell us about this kind of industry. There's a second component that I would like to mention, and again, I would like to thank the panelists for having brought this into the conversation, which is the importance of having good uh, industrial relations and CBAs. We aim at having collective bargaining agreements in place so that wages on top of those updated minimum wages can be negotiated directly by the parties so to find the best number that can serve clearly multiple interests. Now for CBS to happen, we need to work more on industrial relations. And this is another key enabler for wages to grow. So in our wage strategy, we believe that there are several components, minimum wage, 
industrial relations, purchasing practices are all key elements into it. But we do not want to forget what we have also added into this work, which is uh, really wage management systems. So having proper uh, systems that will allocate workers to be uh, paid different salaries according to their skills, according to their experience, according after all to the real contribution they make to the factories they work for. And we did do this. This has been our main commitment when we uh, talked about fair living wages in 2013. The data are uh, transparent, are public. They can be uh, looked at in our website. And I also want to say that soon we will have an external research really um, um, making uh, all of these numbers in one place and really showing the impact we have managed to uh, to get on wages. So please uh, stay tuned on this one. Um, soon enough, in a couple of months, it's an independent research will be published and I would be very happy to share it with all of you so that we can take one more conversation on this topic that is absolutely complicated and where we would like to learn from our past successes and also mistakes. Now, going back to your question on the risk, and sorry for this slightly long detour I have taken. The risk we see with uh, purchasing practices and with the ring fencing of the labor is that it might not be enough. We ring fence on the basis of what the wages actually are today. And in this way, we secure that wages are paid correctly. But these alone cannot really drive wages up. And this is our ambition, to see an increase, a constant increase of wages. Uh, you could ask me, uh, and I think this was also one of the suggestions that came from the debate before, why don't you just pay more? Why don't you just add cents on that ring fencing? Yes, we could do that. but. This is a very competitive industry. And if we do it for our orders, it is not guaranteed at all that others will also do it for their own orders. So there's been studies that show that brands that have been trying to do this have not actually reached the goals that they were having, living wages, because just adding a few cents on only our orders will not make the difference we want to see on the ground. So we need to work systemically together using several leverages, several levers to make wages go up. And I just want to recognize also the importance of efficiency. I mean, efficiency must be key because we know that minimum wages cannot grow more than what is possible for them to grow depending on the productivity level of those markets. So you see that a question, an issue that seems simply to be a negotiation between the suppliers and the brands become a very deep economical issues that needs to be addressed also with the regulators and with the legislators in the country. This is what we're looking for. This is the change we want to make in the world. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, Robin, I did see you unmute for a little bit, and I believe that you would want to share um, a compliment to the discussion that is going on. Um, I'll look just, just to reiterate what we said about before. Um, we realize this is a very complicated issue for brands, um, for, for factories, for manufacturers, but just you know, from the from the investor point of view, I reiterating what I said before, that we believe that companies that can do this as hard as it is, that it is better for their supply chains, they can have a better understanding of their supply chains, stronger and more resilient, they're prepared for the coming regulation and legislation, as we said, their reputation, their brand image, meeting customer expectations. Um, and, you know, generally, we believe that companies that can address their human rights risks have better financial performance over the long term better governance and management, can seize the opportunities. And we find that companies that are paying living wage or, or are working clearly towards paying living wage have less systemic labour rights violations overall. So it's part of that bigger picture of human rights. And operationally, and you know, you know these, these statistics, but you know, having, having attention to living wage can lead to decreased worker turnover, improved motivation and morale better product quality, better productivity, avoiding sudden cost increases, um, more, more stable earnings, uh, attracting talent and, you know, raised delivery performance and optimising costs. So, look, as, as 
technically difficult as it is, and we understand that you know differing um, differing viewpoints and the differing um, concerns around the the actual tool of separating out the labour costs for investors. We don't really we don't have visibility down to that level to actually be able to enforce it. The one thing that it does do for us is that it, it shows us that the company's moved past making a policy, moved past making a commitment to actually working on those purchasing practices to actually to actually try and address this. You know, very, very often we see a lot of policies and a lot of uh, commitments, but not a lot of concrete plans, not a lot of actual uh, clear, at least to us as investors, transparent changes to purchasing practices. So if we do see a company is trying to do these things, a brand is trying to address that, that at least gives us as investors um, clarity that they're trying to move forward in, in a concrete way to make impact. But, you know, again, the more transparency we can get there so that we as investors can, can support the brands uh, moving forward on these issues and it, that, you know, in turn support way down the supply chain, that's our goal. Um, Realising it, 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 you know, it's a, it's a very technically difficult thing, but it, that it's a really important thing that we need to work on at all levels, for, right from the investor to the brand, right down to the worker. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, Faisal, I do see you You have your hand up and I'm sorry, I, I need to also kind of, we're uh, coming back to time and do want to um, ask the questions, Q&A Q from the audience and kind of uh, go through that. Um, uh, Kalpona, I, there uh, was a question where an audience wanted to know about excess working hours and exceeding legal maximum overtime hours in countries. How can we remedy the hours that employers are worked without hurting the take home wages that employees are receiving? I would kindly request you to be um, precise. Sorry about sure, that. Yeah I, yeah, I will try my best to be precise, okay? So when we talk about overtime and excessive overtime, many things are involved with, okay? So why workers need to work like longer shifting hour is because the factory takes a lot of orders. Lead time is an issue. And top of that, the first fashion also an issue. Like uh, from a uh, sample to uh, taking the goods, uh, taking a production, sorry, product to the high street, I think it's a few weeks in between, okay? So in order to meet all these shipments, workers need to work in a longer longer shifting hour. And in here, we don't have double shift. The workers, is the same worker working like over, over time. And sometimes they want to do that too. It is both way. It is force over time and uh, the other way around, the workers also do want it to over time. The force over time due to, as factory have rushed shipment, they have more orders than I would say, the, you know, than their capacity. And why workers wanted to do that? Because their wages is not sufficient for their monthly cost. So, uh, so they want like more wages to take a home wage as a, including over time. So they have extra money to, you know, uh, fulfill their monthly costs. So this is like two reasons. And the remedy, of course, we need to say no to the first fashion and then ensure living wage. So these two things can bring a healthy remedy uh, for workers in the production countries. And I, if I get like 30 seconds, when, uh, you know, Sarah, you say that, yeah, you can add, but uh, as this business is so competitive, it is not possible. You don't know that whether others will be doing or not. But you know what I think? Someone always can stand up. Uh, why not that H&M can be the leader of it? Like when we had a court campaign prior to this 2013 campaign, in 2012, we got two brands who signed the accord before Rana Plaza. That is PVH and Chibo from Germany. So they, did, they, they signed before this 100 and, uh, you know, 1100, sorry, 1130 workers killed, but you all did sign, but after this big push. So why not that H&M just take a leadership, start adding few cents more and ensuring the living wage for their workers and asking others to join in the board. I think the others will listen to you then. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kalpona. Um, I we have um, thank you so much to the panelists and the audiences 
for um, their time today. I think we've heard interesting cases for separating labor costs as an important step um, towards not only addressing human rights risks, but also making sure that the women who make our clothes are paid a living wage. And it can also ensure competitiveness in the industry. Now, we'll, um, what would you like to see eventually? And uh, what do you think the next step is in the move towards living wages? How should brands go forward from here? Um, let's end with these two questions. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining the session and for your time. Uh, thank you so much for your um, wonderful facilitation, um, Nirvana. Uh, we, um, again, I want to apologize to everybody for the technical difficulties. I do have your emails and with permission of the panelists, I will um, be very happy to um, forward you the recording from today and also some additional resources. Um, I am noting that um, we have um, a, a couple of minutes of time here um, and that there was a question asked directly to Sarah in the chat box. Um, and um, yeah, so if you if you want to take that next couple of minutes to answer that or respond to anything, um, uh, you could. Um, answering very briefly. Thank you, Sarah. Absolutely. Sorry, I was trying to type the answer, but I had to take the uh, the meeting on my phone and so I wasn't able to type at the same time. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to answer about the, uh, the efficiency. So the question goes like, uh, efficiency goes hand in hand with prior investments. Could you indicate how H&M supports the suppliers in making more efficient production? So uh, about that, um, there's been a, a few things that we've done to support efficiency. The most direct initiative has been really an efficiency program in which our own engineers go, uh, work hand in hand with the suppliers to find out ways where we can be, make the production floor become more efficient. So it is not about increasing the productivity or uh, the speed of the production in terms of uh, workers, but it's rather how to get organized in a better way in the production floor so that the different steps of the production can be smoother. And this will make it possible for us to reach higher efficiency. Now, the efficiency point is very dear to me because it is one of the key components to really understand how we can ring fence the labor. So first of all, uh, in order for us to be able to ring fence properly, we need to know the wages of the workers at the month level. And they believe that H&M is uh, publishing these uh, data on our website exactly because we want to be transparent about how much our workers make. Then we need to have data about the efficiency. And then we need to have data about a rather complex and technical topic, which is the SMP, uh, which is uh, the standard minute value. So the um, analysis that the industry has done about how long it takes to make a specific products. When you have three, these are three elements, you can actually do the ring fence. This is what our uh, years working on this topic has, uh, has actually taught us, and this is what we put in practice. So efficiency, definitely a key component. Uh, I, I welcome the encouragement for us to take a, a step ahead and basically really lead the change and start doing a different type of ring fencing. So ring fencing more, ring fencing above what the workers actually get today so that we can increase wages. That's an excellent idea. But it is really difficult in this, in this industry because uh, if you think about that, you would basically, with this additional ring fencing, subsidize the other companies that are working in the same factory. Uh, you would pay also for them. And this is very difficult simply in this kind of economical context and in this uh, um, uh, industry where we share suppliers and where the suppliers are making products for us and also for others. And this is why I am really in favor of looking into a system that would make it compulsory by law. So having a push from the regulations, having a push from the minimum wage so that we can 
all ring fangs at the same increased amount would be, I think, one of the key solutions we should all together, uh, together really fight for. Uh, so maybe this is my, my last point on efficiency and on how uh, an uh, updated way of ring fencing could work, possibly. Thank you so much. And um, just for one final point, we had one last question that I will allow because it was so good. Um, somebody asked Kalpana um, if they wanted to support your work, how they could do that. Thank you so much. Yeah. So first of all, you know, we run a lot of solidarity campaign uh, through uh, Clean Talks campaign through industrial, uh, you know, to improve the working condition here in Bangladesh as well as in other production country. So please join them. Uh, this is this is crucial. And you know, how are you going to help us? You know, in 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 the ground here, uh, you know, resource support. We we take funds. So in that way, you definitely can help us. Uh, you know, uh, to funding. So we have our website, please go there and reach out to us. Uh, we, we definitely can speak from there. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody who uh, joined. Oh, Nina, Nina, uh, Nina, hi. Yes, I, I need to say a few words. I'd like to have a concluding a uh, few words, please. Yes, yeah, of course. I'm, I of am course. Uh, participating. Yeah, of course. Yeah, please. So, all right. Um, right. So, you know, I, I mean, Again, you know, with due respect to all concerned and all the participants who are who are who are, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we are all, you know, sort of discussing the, the issue at hand. But I, I see that H and M's representative, uh, you know, quite clearly objectified and said, you know, like uh, uh, that H and M is, uh, you know, these are the initiatives H and M is doing, and and so on and so forth. I'm sure they are. I'm not an H and M vendor, so I wouldn't know exactly how how. Uh, they, they approach their, uh, you know, vendor base. Uh, I, I am obviously here as an industry representative, so I, I will speak on that behalf. You see, uh, you know, whether it's brands, it's the unions, whoever it is, at the end of the day, right, um, you know, somebody has to receive and that somebody is the factory as well as the, as well as the laborers and, and all of the people in the supply chain or the receiving end, that is. Now, now you know, uh, I, I have already put it down. Uh, I put a message out there where I wrote, uh, you know, it would be interesting to take an independent survey of to see the price situation. Is there, yeah. Hi, I, are you able to hear, are you here, able to listen to what I'm saying? Hello? We can yeah, hear you now. The last... you mute. Yes. Yeah, sorry. All right. So, so, uh, so what I was saying was, uh, I was saying that uh, I think that uh, what what we need is an independent survey to be made to see if uh, the price trends of factories receiving over the past two years is there been an upward trend or a downward trend? Because because if if we if we if, then that should reflect where the brands stand as far as the pricing is concerned and i think that uh, i think that that's that's important to set the set the set the overall roadmap to the living wages to everything that we want to attain whether it is the labor side or the factory side i think i think that would be a, a good start because if we don't receive the you know the right pricing then then we can't afford to pay uh, let alone uh, living wages actually to be able to you know even sustain in the industry and and we are happy to show you know the investments that we're making to be efficient to do everything else but i think it's time the brands need to step up and show what exactly are they doing and with factuals with informations that will be my request thank you very much all thank you fazal and um i think look there's um there's been some really strong suggestions from all of our panelists i know that you know your last statement probably opened up a number of questions and statements that people wanted to make but um and apologies to this um shortened session tonight but we will have to leave it there um i will send some additional information and um providing i get permission from all the panelists a recording of today's session to everybody who registered for tonight um, thank you once again and have a wonderful evening, afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.